so I started thinking about where does voice come from? Where does narrative voice come from? Where does where does a book come from? So I'm going to take you through a, a bit of a journey um, on how I wrote. Um, Picturing gone. Um, it took me, I had two years where I wrote almost nothing. Um, and of course, during that time, I was thinking, where does the book come from? Because there was no book coming from anywhere. Um, so um, I, I started to think a lot about uh, waiting, waiting for a book. How you have to wait until the brain is ready to write a book. Um, so this is my journey. I would say writing this book. So let's go to the next. So I started thinking, <laughs> what is voice? Why is my voice different from your voice? What makes a writer have a, a, something different to say, have a different narrative? You know, if everyone in this room had to go off and
and I have a memory, a fantastic memory, of lying on my bed with the sun coming in through the window for 10 minutes and feeling perfectly happy. Now, why was I so happy? I don't know. I can't remember, but I remember that feeling. And that stuck in my calendar. You know, there's other things. There's things I remember from being a child. There's, you know, things that arguments or, you know, I remember when the plane was flew into the World Trade Center. I remember where I was when John F. Kennedy was shot. Those are the big things. But lots of little things, too. And if all of us could take the calendar out of our head and spread what was in our brain, the memories in our brain, out on a big white table here, the thing you would notice, of course, is that what's in your brain is completely 100% different from what's in anybody else's brain. And that's true even if you have a twin sister or a best friend and you always think the same things. What's in your calendar is different from what's in everybody else's. And that's what makes your voice. Because what's in your brain tells you what you're interested in. You know, if I drive in a landscape, uh, through a landscape in a car, I'm always looking for the animals. You know, my husband looks at the trees. My husband's a painter, he paints landscapes and trees. He's not so interested in animals. So already, we're looking at two different landscapes when we look at the same landscape. Um, let's go to the next one. Now, throughness is the word that I found. I didn't invent it, but I started riding horses when I was 50. I'm 57 now. And I always loved horses when I was a child, but I never really, I grew up in the suburbs, I never really got a chance to ride horses. But I was 50 and I thought, I'm a rider now, I work at home, I have a little extra money, I'm going to learn to ride horses properly. Now my teacher would say to me all the time, what you need, you need to be more through. And I said, what does that mean? What do you mean more through? And she said, you more through, because horse people, you know, can barely speak English, really. Um, so I looked up throughness, and it's defined as a circle of energy that goes between the rider and the horse. And it, it, it starts in the rider, because the rider wants to do something. The rider wants to maybe go from walk to trot. And so the rider has to tell the horse. Now, let's go to the next one. This is a picture that I stole from a woman I know who also took up riding very late. And she, on her blog, she was writing about the fact that she was going to ride this amazing horse. This horse was trained so fantastically, and she was going to get to ride it. So she had a friend take a picture of her riding this amazing, amazing, highly trained horse, and she wrote, I don't know what was wrong with the horse. It wasn't very photogenic, maybe, or maybe it was having a bad day, or I don't know what. She said she came because it looks just like a boring pony. So she came back a few days later, and she saw the same horse ridden by its proper rider, and that's the next slide, and that's the same horse. Now that to me is one of the most beautiful examples of throughness. You know, before it looks like a pump, like a pump just kind of walking along, and when it goes, when the energy starts to go through the rider, through the horse, it becomes something very beautiful. And, and dressage, which people are very uh, contemptuous of, um, was actually invented by Xenophon. Uh, well, he wrote about it first in 400 BC, I think. And it was to train horses to be very, um, like ballet dancers, to be very strong and very flexible and to be able to be um, effective in war. So a horse who was like this was very light and very strong and very, very athletic in a war, could swivel, could move very quickly, you know, it could run away if it had to, it could, you know, it was very responsive. Um, so
So throughness is what I started to think about. And then I started to think about writing in terms of throughness. And writers often talk about a state that they have where, you know, there's a word in English that you talk about, um, what is it, the uh, flow. Is it flow? Yeah. Where you're in this flow and it's all happening and you're writing and it's amazing. But I hate the word flow because it doesn't explain anything. It doesn't say how you got there, where you are, you know, how you might get there again. But I started to think about the furnace. And I thought, if you're, let's think about the, let's think of the rider of the horse as the conscious mind. And, and the horse as the unconscious mind. So you have a connection between the horse and the rider, but it has to be a soft, responsive connection. Because if you pull on a horse, it gets angry and it won't do what you want. It has to be... It has to be understanding, it has to be a flow of energy between conscious mind, smaller, more rational, and unconscious mind, this big force, this big animal force. And that connection between conscious and unconscious mind is what I think of as throughness. Now, everyone has a connection with your unconscious mind. When you go to sleep at night, you fall asleep, you start to tell stories, your brain starts to tell stories. You dream. The dreams that you, that you dream are not rational stories. Um, you don't dream that I came to school and I you know, wrote a paper. You dream of strange things. I came to school without any clothes on. Or I came to school, but it wasn't a school, it was a tree. You know, where, you know it was my home, but it wasn't my home. So there, it's the brain is telling your unconscious mind, when you shut off the conscious, is starting to tell stories. Um, now, how do you make that connection stronger? Um, I have a friend who's a, a writer, and he's also a, a sort of a, a mystic in a way, and um, he said that he said to me once that he's a, a, a friend of the Dalai Lama. And he said that uh, the Dalai Lama meditates for four hours a day. And meditation is maybe a state of living in your unconscious mind, of improving the connection between your conscious and your unconscious mind. Um, a lot of writers write first thing in the morning because they're still a little bit asleep. So they have the conscious, the unconscious hasn't gone away yet. It's still sort of lurking there. Um, I have a little bit of a theory that the more time you spend thinking about things, the more time you, you crawl through that passage between your conscious and your unconscious mind, the bigger the passage becomes and the easier it becomes to walk from one to the other. Now, there are certain things that will stop you from ever going into your unconscious mind. And the biggest Thing that stops people from accessing their unconscious mind is fear. Um, I think, you know, this is just my opinion, I think usually it's fear of death. People who don't want to think that someday they're going to die. I mean, people tend to be terrified about that. Depending on what your nationality is, you're more scared or less scared. Um, I, 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 although I live in England, I'm American, and much more frightened because they have a feeling that they all want to live forever and that if they spend enough money, um, you know, getting their faces pushed up and, you know, uh, having special treatments that they will never die. English people, of course, are more cynical. Um, they think, yeah, you know, oh well, if I die. And, and actually, I, had, I discovered after writing my first novel, in fact, the week it came out, I discovered that I had cancer. And my youngest sister had already died of cancer. And my middle sister also had cancer. So for me, it could well have been the doctor saying to me, you're going to die much sooner than you think. Um, but because I think I had a natural affinity for England, my very first thought when the doctor said, I'm sorry, but the tumor was malignant, I thought, oh, well, thank goodness, I don't have to finish my second book. <laughs> 
So, you know, I think that's maybe more an English attitude. Um, but there are other fears that, that keep people from accessing their self, their unconscious. You know, there's fears of maybe something that happened in the past, or fear of a relationship you don't want to think about. Um, you know, somebody who's had a terrible thing happen to them might not want to go into their unconscious because it feels dangerous in there. And it is, the unconscious is a dark and dangerous place. And of course, that's why writers spend so much time there. And I think good writers um, are, are interested in, in looking at the dangers, looking at the darkness. And of course, most of my writer friends um, are depressed. I mean, we're cheerful. We're cheerful, funny depressives. But most of us are depressives. And I think it's because we live back here so much. So that's the, that's rudeness. Um, now, this is my, my mother's idea for me. She always says, Meg, it, you should write about a little, a nice, a nice middle-aged couple getting a divorce because that's what people are really interested in. But what I say to her is, I can't write about a nice middle-aged couple getting a divorce because the one part of my life that has always been good is my marriage. My marriage is so boring. My husband and I like each other. We get along. We laugh. We, you know, it's fine. So I haven't had to think too much about the agony of divorce. Maybe someday I will, who knows? I fall in love with a young woman or a young man, who knows? Um, next one. Um, my father um, died about seven or eight years ago, and virtually his last words to me were, why don't you write a trilogy? Now, my parents are very worried that I'm a writer that maybe, you know, will end up starving and I'll run out of ideas that people will stop buying my books. And so they, have, they keep coming up with these ideas for me, how to make a lot of money. Um, I, I can't, so far at least, I can't write a trilogy because my books are very short. I always think, well, if you don't like them, at least they're short. Um, the idea that I could write what happens next is completely impossible. Now, part of that is also because Plot, story, is not really what I'm mostly interested in. What I'm mostly interested in is brains, is people's psychological journeys, rather than their physical journeys. Of course, you have to put a bit of plot in the book. Um, for many years, I think, um, I didn't believe that I could ever be a writer, because, you know, I wasn't really interested in what happens next. And I can say very happily, to, to people, I loved that book. And they'll say, oh, yeah, wasn't it great when such and such happened? And I think, did such and did that happen? I, I don't remember that. I remember the characters being wonderful and vivid. I don't really remember what happened very much because I'm not that interested in what happened. I'm interested in how it happened, how the people came together to make something happen. So I'm not going to write a book about the age book. And of course, I'm not going to write a trilogy. What's next? Ah, so day one. Now this is day one of how to write a book. And nothing. In the last two books I've written, I've finished them, and I've been kind of exhausted. And I've really thought, okay, I'll give myself a few weeks, I'll answer my emails, I'll pay my bills, I'll pay attention to my daughter, who, you know, I can't remember her name. Um, <laughs> And I'll try to be a good mother and maybe a good wife, I'll cook dinner, you know. And then after a couple of weeks, I'll start writing again. But I have to wait for the idea to come of what I'm going to write about. I can't just say, because I'm not so interested in story, I can't just say, well, I'm going to write a story about, a, you know, uh, something or other. Uh, I'll start that tomorrow. I'm waiting for, for my calendar all the stuff that's in my brain to tell me what I'm interested in, what I'm going to write about next. So day one is nothing. Now for this book, I had two years of nothing. Um, two years where I was waiting and waiting, and with things happening in my brain, but I it wasn't really conscious. I didn't exactly know what they were. I was kind of thinking about what I might write about, but really I had no idea. And in my family, because my husband is a painter, and he doesn't really make very much 
much money at all. I'm the person who pays for the house and the bills and the school and everything. So um, my family is very used to the fact that I, if I don't have an idea for a book, um, I start to panic. And um, uh, this was before, just before Christmas, I think. And I said to my daughter, I'm sorry, we're having no Christmas this year. We can't afford any presents. And she looks at me, she goes, no presents at all? And I said, wait, just one present. But I hardly any presents, cheap, horrible presents. Um, and, um, and I think that's it. I've written my last book. I will never write a book again. My brain is a big, black, empty hole. That's, that's day one. That comes next. I've got a few pictures here of what it looks like, and we can go to the next two, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really, that's definitely, could be, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Now, I, my editor, in the meantime, is emailing me or calling me all the time saying, So, Meg, how is your new book coming? And what do you say to your editor? You say, fine. It's going really well. I can't tell you too much about it now. But it's great. And she was calling me, you know, month after month, a little suspicious that I wasn't telling her anything about this book. Of course, it wasn't a book. And at the time, I was blogging. And I wrote a blog about, I knew that my editor read my blog. So I wrote a blog about how do you name characters. And I said, well, you, know, you look on um, baby sites, you know, name your celebrity baby. Or, because I believe that names have to have a lot of weight. That you don't just choose a name at random. Your name has to tell you something about the character. So my books are partly short because I want everything to be very heavy. Um, in a way, I don't want pages and pages describing something. I want to tell you. So, for instance, in the book How I Live Now, this girl named Daisy goes to live with this <clears throat> family in the English countryside, her cousins who she's never met. The cousins are called Piper, Isaac, Edmund, and Osbert. Now, you maybe have to be a little bit English to understand that you know a lot just from the names in that family. <clears throat> you know that the parents uh, are eccentric, that they've chosen rather odd names. Um, of course, this was 10, 10 years ago, before everybody named their child Apple. Um, but um, the names are slightly old English. Edmund is a very old-fashioned name. Osbert is a name that nobody calls their child anymore. Um, so you have a sense already, a picture, that this isn't an ordinary family where the children are called Amanda, Chloe, <clears throat> Jack, and, you know, whatever, uh, George. Um, so I wrote a blog about the names, and in the blog I said, now, in my new book that I am writing now, my main character is called Mila. And I wanted it to be Mila because I wanted it to sound a little bit exotic, maybe a little bit, maybe Eastern European, or, you know, because she had a very mixed upbringing. I wanted her to be a little bit of an odd child. Um, of course, there was no character, there was no Mila. But I knew my editor would read the blog, and when she read the blog, she would be convinced that I was really writing a book with a main character called Mila. So I wrote the blog, I sent it off. My editor shut up for a while. I didn't hear anything. And then a month went by, another month, another month, I'm still not writing. I took my dogs to the park one day. I take them every morning. And this little dog that looked just like that came running up to me. And it was very friendly. And I didn't see any owner around. And I stooped down to pat this dog. And I looked at the name on the tag of the dog's collar, and it said Mila. Now, Mila is a very unusual name in England, 
And I want to say now, I do not believe that there is a god of writing who sends writers messages, you know, through dog tags in the park. But it did feel as if something was telling me to start work. And I went home and I wrote the first line. I remember two years it had been where I hadn't really been writing at all. And I wrote the first line of this book, and it didn't change. It says, the first meal was a dog, a Bedlington Terrier, which is what that is. It helps if you know these things. I'm not at all resentful at being named after a dog. In fact, I can imagine the scene exactly. Mila, my father would have said, that's a nice name, forgetting where he heard it. And then my mother would remember the dog and ask if he was absolutely sure. And when he didn't answer, she would say, okay then, Mila. And looking at me, say, Mila, my Mila. So I wrote that paragraph down that very afternoon and the whole book was in my head. Suddenly it was in my head. I knew exactly what it was, who the main characters were gonna be, where it was set, which was very strange because all my books had been set in England. And this book, for some reason, had to be set in upstate New York, which is great. You know, I'm an American, I lived for 10 years in New York City, but I had never been to upstate New York. So I tried to move the book to New England and to Maine, where I, which I know very, very well, but the book wouldn't move. It wanted to be in upstate New York. So I had to go and do a trip to upstate New York and, and have a look around. When you think about the idea that a book is suddenly in your head, that you know who the characters are. Whoops. Anybody alive? <clears throat> Where it's going to be set. Pretty much everything. I pretty much just had to write that book down. It wasn't too difficult to write. And it's not that I believe that there's a magic that where a book arrives in your head in one moment. That my daughter is studying physics, and she says it makes her very angry when she reads about the history of physics and Archimedes, or whoever it was, uh, in the bath, you know, saying, Eureka, I have discovered displacement, or I have discovered, I don't know, I don't understand physics at all. <clears throat> I've discovered gravity by an apple falling on somebody's head. She said, it doesn't work that way. You think about something for 10 years, and then one moment, an apple falls off a tree onto your head, and suddenly it comes together, and you're talking about gravity. And it's the same with the book. For those two years, all the things in my calendar were going round and round and round, and one day there was a little ping, and out came the book. This is how I imagined my character. She was meant to be 12 years old. I'm not sure how old she is. But there, there are certain children who I'm sure everyone has met one where they seem not to be children at all. They seem to be strangely wise. Um, you know, there's almost a tribe of them, wise children, uh, who look at you in a way that you feel that they may have lived before. And I'm very interested in, in those children. I occasionally meet one. And I met one, of my, one of my closest friends had a baby. She brought her home from the hospital one day old. And I have a distinct, distinct memory of this tiny baby. And she's a great party girl and a drinker. She had all her friends come around to say hello to this baby. And I have such a strong memory of this baby looking at all of us like this. Now, of course, she's one day old. She probably didn't do that, but the impression I got from her was that there was something more than just a little blank brain in there. Um, she's 22 now, um, and she is a wise child. She has a strange quality about her that she does seem to have lived before. Um, so that's this was my this was in my head. This was what who Mila was. Um, you have her up here. Yay! Um, while, I was, while I was writing the book, and just before I was writing the book, um, uh, I was obsessed with Sherlock. 
you know, it's a bit of a worry because, you know, I'm 57, uh, he's sort of autistic and strange and why do I have such a crush on him? But everybody in England has a crush on him. So I was thinking about how, what a fantastically appealing idea it is to walk into a room, you look at a person and you say, aha, you have an orange cat at home. <laughs> you know, ah, you know, you have three brothers and, you know, and, and it is kind of, that is kind of unrealistic magic. But on the other hand, there are people who, who have an ability when they meet someone to see more in a situation than everyone else does. They are looking for small clues. I heard a d detective story on the radio recently, and it was about a, um, a, a gypsy, a fortune teller. And the fortune teller had said something to this detective about her father. And she said, I know how she, I know how she knew about my father. And she said, I'm wearing a, a gold man's watch. It's not a watch that a woman would buy. It's a watch that a father would give his daughter after, leave his daughter after he died. Because she had to, the fortune teller had said, your father has recently died. So it's clues, it's clues, a lot of it is unconscious. Um, but anyway, I gave the, that ability to see, and to see more in a situation to this little girl. And of course, it's a very tempting thing to do because you immediately have a wonderful um, tension between a child who can see things in a situation but possibly not understand. Uh, next one. Um, at the same time, I was thinking a lot about lying to children and how adults almost, without thinking about it, lie to children. You know, and this, of course, is the great lie. Um, you know, we had a terrible time in my family. <clears throat> uh, we told my daughter when she was born, uh, practically, that she'd say, Mommy, is there such a thing as God? And we would say, well, nobody knows. Your father and I don't believe in God, but some people do. If you want to believe in God, that's fine. You can make up your own mind. But there's a guy in a red suit with a beard who flies through the air every Christmas and puts presents down the chimney for every child in the world. And my daughter went, really? I dragged my husband out of the river and I said, we can't, we can't do this, we can't tell her this stupid lie. She'll never trust us again. Anyway, my husband loves all the romance of Christmas and you know, he would leave pictures of reindeer, little letters from the reindeer and hoof prints all over the house. And I was like, don't do it. And then one day when my daughter was six, she said to my husband, Daddy, is there really such a thing as Santa Claus? And he said, no. Nope. <laughs> and she said, Very, very frightened. And for years after that, she was frightened. 
you know, she didn't like me to be out of her sight, she couldn't sleep at night, you know, and, and I trace it back to not being truthful enough about <clears throat> what happened with cancer. So the, that, that was also going around in my column here, telling the truth to children. <clears throat> oh, that's me. Um, the, the dog, there's a very important dog in this book. Um, most of my books have an important dog. Uh, and it's because I'm a bit obsessed with animals. Um, I have two dogs, I ride horses a lot. I had a, I think since I was very, very young, I had a kind of throughness um, with, with animals. I feel I kind of know how they think. I probably don't, but you know, I feel a real connection. Now this was a dog who lives in my neighborhood. And I, I never knew this dog, I never knew the owner, but I would see it coming and going. You can sort of see in this picture that it has an incredible dignity about it. It seems as if it has an incredible dignity about it. And it just curled into my book. And when I finished writing the book about this, and, and there's a very, this very dignified dog in it. And the question in the book is, is a man who disappears, he leaves home, he leaves his wife and his baby. But the real mystery in a way is he leaves his dog. And his wife hates his dog, so why don't you leave your dog that you love with somebody who hates it? <clears throat> so the dog is quite important. And after I finished writing the book, and when it came out, I was walking through the neighborhood and I saw the woman with the dog, and I ran up to her. And I said, I've written a book that has your dog in it. Uh, can, I take, can, can, I, can, can my husband take a picture of me with your dog? And I gave her a copy of the book. And so that's me with the dog in the book. Now, I love this picture. I found this on the internet, but it's a fantastic picture. Can you see what it is? Man hiding behind a tree. There are times when you're writing, and I don't know if any of you are writers, but even when you write an essay or a letter or anything, <clears throat> where you feel like you're dragging your story, which weighs a thousand pounds, up a steep hill. Um, you know, climbing Everest with a piano on your back. And that's not the good times. The good times are when the story is a few steps ahead of you. It's coming straight out of your unconscious mind, and you're just writing it down <clears throat> as it comes out. And sometimes it feels almost like taking dictation. It's, your, it's being led by your un unconscious mind. And you can really feel, I think, when you're reading a book, whether the author is dragging it along, or whether the story is kind of prancing ahead of the author, and the author is just trying to write it. So following the story is, is much more exciting. I mean, if, if you want a metaphor, think of relationships, okay? Everybody has gone out with somebody, uh, you know, some partner, some boyfriend, some girlfriend, whatever, um, where you really feel like you're dragging it along. It's not coming happily. You know, you're saying, well, he does, you know, he didn't call me because he forgot, you know, he was in a car crash, he had amnesia, you know, something, always making excuses. Whereas when a relationship goes well, whether it's a, a love affair or a friendship, it sort of it floats ahead of you and you feel you can follow it. So throughness, I think, applies to everything in life, not just writing. <clears throat> Um, this is just a nice picture. This is how I wrote this book. I wrote it in, I, I, do, I don't just write one draft, I usually write about <clears throat> 100 drafts. But very, very thin. It was like thin layers of paint. Like, like, and this is a, a cross-section of apparently a, a paint chip of a room that had been painted over and over and over again since the house was built in 1810. Fantastic picture. But I just loved it because it felt just how writing a book can be. Putting on thin, thin layers of paint and adding up the story so that it gets more and more three dimensional. Um, this is just a line from the book. I cannot picture me growing up. This is the 12 year old talking. I cannot picture me any different from the me I am now. I cannot picture me old or married or dead. Um, now this is a theme that I'm sort of still working on at the moment. I'm writing a play um, that has a 16-year-old girl who's 
just fallen in love, and an 86-year-old woman who's just fallen in love. And, and it's a dialogue between the two of them, and we start to realize as the play goes on that it's the same woman at two stages of her life. And what I'm interested in is this idea that children and young people, I think, can never really imagine what they're going to be like when they're older. It's almost a foreign country. You know, that adulthood is something that sort of happens to you and makes you into a different person, which of course is not true. Um, the picture we go on is, came out of that quote. And the title again, it sort of leapt into my head. And the first thing all writers do when they come up with a good title is they go onto Google immediately and Google because it sounds so right that you think maybe somebody's used it before. But in this case, it was a song from 1958 or something, so it was okay. Now, the last question in the book, and I said I had a whole book in my head when I started to write it. It was about a, you know, a father and daughter who traveled from London to America to try to find his friend who has, for some reason, walked out of his family. And I said, you know, and I wrote all those lovely thin layers, thin layer after thin layer. The problem is, I didn't know why the man left. And I kept thinking, I mean, it's, a, it's a mystery. I was writing a mystery, but I didn't know why he left. I didn't know what the answer to the mystery was. And I kept thinking, all right, if I hold my nerve, if, I'm, if I don't panic, eventually the book will tell me why he left, the character will get to a point where he tells me why he left. And I did hold my nerve for about eight months of writing. And I kept trying to think, okay, he's a child molester. He killed somebody by mistake. You know, he has another wife somewhere. I don't know. All these big plot ideas. And in the end, it was not that. Uh, oh, this is just <clears throat> what I try to live by my very little patience. And the next one. At the end, I started to think of a, a, of a metaphor of what happens when you have a, a floorboard that starts to twist and, and, and never untwists. And I started to think of a, of a person who was like a floorboard. Something happened to him and he started to twist. And instead of untwisting, he twisted more and more and more. So it was just a, a lot of small events in his life that caused him eventually to leave. Um, and I think that's it. Let's see, is anyone more? Oh, and that's the American and the English kind of set. Is that the end? Oh, yeah. And that's where I am at. The day the book is finished, that's where I am again. And that's the end.